So Chuck. Yeah. You, you ever wonder how airplanes fly? You know. You ever, have you ever walked up to one? And I sound like the guy in the Matrix. You ever marvel at an airplane that <laughs> 300 tons of metal? Mr. Anderson. Fly? <laughs> no, he was talking to uh, uh, Morpheus at that oh, time. Oh, Morpheus, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right, because he was talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was trying to get him to reveal the codes the, for The Zion. codes for uh, Zion, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyhow, th- have you ever marveled at an airplane of all sizes, they just go fast forward and then they fly? Do you ever pause and reflect on this? Yeah, I'm not going to say I have, to be honest. <laughs> 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 I'd be lying. It's just said. give me the scotch before we take off, That's and I'm good. All right. Go. I'll tell you what I marvel at. What? Uh, how sometimes I get a really decent meal in first class. That, to me, <laughs> is a modern aviation marvel. Okay. All right. So, so here you go. So you may have noticed that all airplanes have wings. Yes. Okay. Now so I have... Wings- <laughs> Wings are a good thing. That's a good thing. I will uh, say. They, they also have mini wings on the tail. Okay. Right. And then they have like a vertical wing, uh, yep. which is like the stabilizer wing. And so that prevents it from sort of uh, fishtailing. Right. Uh, because if it's going quickly through the air and air parts on the left and right side of that tail fin, that gives the plane stability moving in one direction. Okay. okay? Now, when I was a kid, I built model airplanes that flew, uh, gliders. And I tried making gliders without a tail fin, and it just fishtailed the whole time. It just didn't, it couldn't stabilize. So I, so doing piece by piece, adding and subtracting bits to my, to my models, I was able to sort of learn early on in my life what role these were playing in the stability and the lift on an airplane. So now, you may have also noticed the shape of the cross section of a wing. Yes. So if you take a cross section of a wing, and sometimes you can see this. No, oh, yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, you can see it when you're on the, if you sit on the wing of a on plane. On the wing. On when the you're wing, sitting right. in the wing seat. In the wing you know? seat, right. So so that's usually where the exit, there's usually an exit uh, door above the wing so that you right. can step out. So the top part is curved, okay? And the bottom is, uh, it's typically flat, okay? So you have a pocket of air that the moving wing is passing through. And the air wants to stay as one parcel. It wants to, okay? Okay. So as you do this, the air on top to go that bigger distance has to travel faster to keep up with the air on the bottom so that when it reconnects, it's the same parcel. Gotcha. All right? So you have forced the air to move faster on the top than on the bottom. And fast-moving air has lower pressure. And I've done this before. Uh, I don't know if we, uh, who's going to be listening to this and who's going to be watching it. But So I'm going to use my letterhead. Okay. So here it is. I don't know if you can see. Uh, from it's, the desk of Neil deGrasse Tyson. No, it's right. It's uh, Hayden Planetarium, uh, right. American Museum of Natural History. So not that it matters what paper you do use, but I'm getting a nice, long, skinny strip from that. There it goes. And here it is, just limp in front of me. And now I'm going to blow across it. Okay, here I go. There you go. I'm blowing on top of it. Top of it, but the, it, 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 it straightens out, lifts up. Correct. So the faster air going on top has lower pressure relative to the pressure of the air on bottom. So the air on bottom presses it's it up. It's pushing. Right. It's pushing. It's pushing it up. You have an entire pair of wings doing this. An entire pair of wings. And the faster you move, the bigger the pressure difference is between the two of them. Period. Okay. So, on the runway, where you're ready to take off. Right. And the plane accelerates. The pressure difference between the top and the bottom is becoming greater and greater and greater. And the plane saying, I'm ready to do this, okay? But you don't want to rely only on that. You want to make sure this happens. So, what? by the way, it continues to accelerate through this. What the pilots do is they, they they up the flaps on the tail wings, okay? Right. 
What does that do? That creates extra pressure to push the tail down, pivoting the nose upwards. Uh -huh. When the nose goes upwards, the upward pressure on the wings is no longer just this Bernoulli effect. Bernoulli is the guy who first uh, 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 decoded this phenomenon. It's not only that, the wing is now pitched upward towards the moving air. Right. It's pitched upward. So air is flying straight into the wing that's going to also add to the Bernoulli effect, and that plane is going to pop. That's why it doesn't slowly gain altitude. That plane changes its angle to the air, and it flies high above the ground. And there's strong reason to do that because it also reduces the acoustic footprint of the takeoff. The higher it can get, the fastest. The faster it can get. The, the less uh, influence that sound is going to have on houses and other things that happen to be in the, in the, in the runway path. Right. Yeah. So. Lowering, your, two, lowering property values everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> and so this effect of pitching the wing so that the moving air just presses it upward is so effective that you don't even need Bernoulli to fly an airplane. Um, you know, you can have Johnson do it, or you can also, you know, Smith. Smith is cool, you know. Uh. <laughs> so the upward pressure will do that. That's why, for example, if you've ever been to an air show, I highly recommend it. Even if you're anti-military, the air shows like display not only military jets, but future of civilian jets. But you should see what your taxpayer money is going towards. OK, mm -hmm. if you have the occasion to visit an air show, they're, they're big ones in the United States, um, in in uh, outside of Paris uh, and outside of London. Uh, yeah. Foreign Borough is one. So these are major air shows. But anyhow, the F-16, as well as other planes, the last I saw it was the F-16 airplane uh, can fly upside down. And oh, yeah, say, I saw a Top Gun. I saw it. Oh, <laughs> how do you fly? If this Bernoulli effect only pushes upwards with that orientation of the wing, how the hell do you fly upside down? You just angle the wings so that the air hitting on the front edge of it, the urge of that is to push it upwards rather than any other direction at all. And if you maintain that pitch of the wings, you can sustain a lift for the airplane. You can fly it at any angle for that. But if you're not otherwise... Uh, in Top Gun or you're doing fancy things, you let Bernoulli do most of the work. Look at that. And there you have it. So you get, yeah, just creating lift. Correct. Now, you have really you seen need. those little winglets at the tip lately in the last 10 years? Almost yes. all planes have them now. All the, the little, planes have a little the, wing the, on the wing. A little, little wing it's, on the wing. It's, it's, like it's like a little wing hand. Like, hey. Um, hey, it's like a little What's wing up? hand. All right. So they knew and learned that air moving over the wing. Oh, by the way, the wings get narrower as you get to the tip. Right. Take a notice of that next time. They're very large as they attach to the airplane, and then they get narrower. That's a very important feature for strength, by the way. Okay? The strongest part of the wing is the nearest part to the plane. All right? That's a good fact. You don't want it breaking somewhere else. All right? Uh, so, so what you have is a... a, a, a so air not only moves over the wing, but it also moves off the wing horizontally. And what they found is the air going off the tip of the wing created little turbulent eddies. Gotcha. And any time you have turbulence, you have a drag, a turbulent drag. Right. And they said, is there any way to smooth over these eddies? And so they did this research under the umbrella of one of the A's of NASA. Recite okay. for me the NASA acronym. I don't know, National Aeronautics. And Space and Administration. Space administration right. The first A in NASA stands for aeronautics. A big part of their budget is to study aeronautics. They discovered that if you put a little uptick, a little up, up angle in the tip of your wing, right. you can boost, the, uh, you can reduce the drag, thereby increasing fuel efficiency, thereby enabling cargo planes to carry that much more and that much farther. Look at that. Overall, they saved between 10 and 15% of all the fuel costs 
the world has seen since that's been introduced. And that is huge. Huge. Yeah. Huge. And yeah, I got to tell you, that's a lot. First of all, it's, I look at it like great for the ecology, it's, you know, that saving. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but if, you, if you're running an airline, you know, it's just it's good for the bottom line. It's good for the bottom line. And so, yeah. and you will also notice that that little piece of the wing, if it's done in a modern design rather than the original designs, they just slap something on there. They like glued it on with, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the modern design- <laughs> Chewing gum. Uh, chewing gum. It's, it's integrated to the shape and the form of the wing. You'll notice that the wing continues to get narrow to that tip, right? right. So it continues to get narrow, easing the air off of the tip so that you don't have this turbulent eddy. So- uh, that's that's how you have that. So now, here's the thing. The plane wants to get airborne as quickly as possible. Right. So there's a speed below which it will stall in the air and just fall out of the sky. Okay. If it's going faster than that, then all the upward forces are keeping it afloat. All right. right? And like I said, less than that, you will stall and drop out of the sky. So when you hit that, Speed, okay. Which so by I believe that. is eighty-eight miles an hour. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, it should be that even if it's not that, right? right. We let it, it let it be. Yeah, <laughs> eighty-eight miles an hour. So, um, so there's the plane. So, so you want the highest possible airspeed. The airspeed is what matters to whether you're going to stall, right? It's how fast is the air moving over your wings. So every plane, if it has the option, is going to take off into the wind. Aha. Uh -huh. Because what matters is not the speed relative to the ground, because a tailwind would give you high speed relative to the ground. But once you're airborne, you want to stay there. And so what matters is the speed over your wings that the air has. And so you take, that's why every airport and aircraft carriers have at least two runways at an angle to each other. So that when the wind direction switches, they can change which runway you're using so that you will always take off into the wind. Nice. Always. And the two, the I forgot what the, is it 45 or 30 degree angle? It's not, it's not at a 90 degree angle to each other. Okay. No, no, because if you do, if you do the math and the geometry on this, you want it to be about a 30 degree angle because then all combinations, what you do is you, if you, if the wind changes direction, then you just take off in the opposite direction of the, of the, all right? And right. You, it turns out many solutions are solved just by having two runways at that angle. And that's why aircraft carriers, you will see, um, just take a look at their shape. But the World War II class aircraft carriers, you could, they had two angles you could land on their Right, deck, yeah. Uh, yeah. On it. And if you're going to land from the direction you're coming, they would turn around the aircraft carrier so that you're coming in against the wind. So, they, you want to take off against the wind. So this makes for a great bit of, um, for someone facing adversity in life. Right. You yeah. say to them that airplane achieves its greatest lift when taking off into the highest headwinds. And that notwithstanding... You are still screwed, my friend. <laughs> you're still flunking this class. <laughs> you are take go to the remedial too class. Bad, <laughs> too bad you're not an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever be a counselor, okay? <laughs> Don't ever be Chuck Nice, the worst life coach ever. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, the uh, fact that you even thought that. Oh my gosh. There's some person who's I got adversity in their life. Oh. Uh, too bad oh. they're not an airplane. Oh well. <laughs> All right. So also, also, um, they land into the wind. Okay? Because they want their slowest possible slowest possible speed relative to the ground right 
and that way, when they reverse the thrust of the engines, that they don't accidentally run off the end of the runway. Right. So that's why planes land and take off in the same direction, often on the same runway. Look that's at that. Why. That's that why. Is, you know, that's and you know how cool. they know which way the wind's blowing? They look at the uh, windsock. Oh, I thought you, I, I was going to say you, you lick your finger. Oh, then they roll down the window of yeah, the 747. Yeah, you roll down the window of the plane, you stick your finger, okay, there we go. That's it. <laughs> Maybe Lindbergh did that, I don't know. All right. Uh, but you look at the windsocks, and I look at the windsock every single time, and I confirm that we are indeed taking off uh, in the direction of the wind. Because it's the opposite direction the windsock is, uh, is pointing. Right. You'll see next yeah, time. Yeah, the, the wind windsock, you want to go against the wind. So wherever yeah, the wind starts the wind. blowing, that ain't the way you want to. It's ain't the way. <laughs> that ain't the way. Real simple. <laughs> yeah, but you can reaffirm that 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 the the traffic controllers are doing the right thing. Right. By by making this observation. Yeah, they're not just right. up there drunk and partying. You know, <laughs> they actually are paying attention. That's they're cool. also paying attention. Oh, that well, that's <laughs> exactly also. The way you said it, they're not just they're drunk just, about it. They're also, they're also looking at your ass, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so all this is going on on the on the runway, and I got more to talk about airports. I mean, I just there's so much going on. You know right, why quick, they call quick? You know, quick thing about you know, you know why they call gates? You know why they call gates? Uh, I, no. They used uh, to be literal gates. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Airports, you you go up to the gate, and they'd open the gate, and then you'd walk onto the tarmac and get on the airplane before oh, that's there right. were Back jetways. Back in the day when they had, you had to climb the stairs to get on the plane. Well, the president still does that when he yeah. lands in different countries, but right. and, and small airports, you would do that. But I'm just saying, they were literal gates. And yeah. then we moved them indoors, and now you have these jetways. You don't even see... When you're, are you, am I indoors? Am I outdoors? Where am I? I'm surprised that they haven't come up with a presidential escalator to get them down from the plane. Because <laughs> that would, you know. Well, just a reminder that it's a real object that really flies. And thanks to engineering for this. The people that say, I don't trust science. And science, de, 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 de. we made a 300 ton hunk of aluminum fly at 550 miles an hour across country serving you hot food and giving you the internet while you sit in your comfortable chair and at the end of that you're to complain that that the that the salad uh, had too much salt that's how and, you know you're living in the future but see the salad did have too much salt Neil I mean I wasn't just nitpicking okay I know I might seem demanding but the, there is a reason behind my complaints. <laughs> you know you're in the future. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, man. Have you ever wanted one of your questions on the universe answered? We all have questions about the universe. From black holes to quasars, quantum entanglement, wormholes. There is no end to the depths of cosmic curiosity. Well, the entry level of Patreon membership with Star Talk gets you just that. I think it starts at $5 a month. You have access to the question line that reaches our Cosmic Query programming. And not only that, we produce a special Cosmic Queries installment just for Patreon members. So if you weren't the director of the Hayden Planetarium, what do you think you would be doing? What? Okay, it, but this had to be another universe. It wouldn't right. happen in this universe. Okay. Uh, I'd be, I'd be a, a, a songwriter for Broadway musicals. Ooh! So... That's the entry level, and the perks ascend from there. Uh, there's a level, in fact, where we send you a, an autographed copy of one of my latest books. Uh, right now, it's Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. And it's signed with my fancy fountain pen with purple ink. So uh, I invite you to just check the link below. And all of that money goes to our ability to experiment with new ways of bringing the universe down to Earth. So thank you for those who have already joined, and we welcome others to participate in this grand adventure of what it is to bring the universe down to Earth. As always, keep looking up. So the first thing, you know, at the, at the TSA, you got the, the X-ray machine, right? You got the X-ray machine. Okay. I just want to alert you of something. There was a day, and I'm old enough to remember, before anything got x-rayed. 
You know why? Because nobody had an x-ray machine to do it. And in the 1960s, there was a spate of, of hijackings. Many of them were to Cuba because we didn't, we, our diplomatic ties had been broken off. Uh, and because the Cuba were like, they were commies, right? They were sympathizers with the Soviet Union and they were in our hemisphere. And so we didn't have planes to Cuba. So if someone wanted to get fly to Cuba, they had to hijack a plane. <laughs> So I don't mean to laugh, but the uh, hijackings to Cuba were like common. So Congress right. said, we got to stop this. The only way we can do it is maybe we can x-ray your luggage. Okay. So does anyone have an x-ray machine that we can just drag in here and do this? Right. That's not so large like you find in the hospital. Oh, yeah. Astrophysicists of the early 1970s had just miniaturized x-ray detectors to put into satellites to observe the universe in the x-ray part of the spectrum because black holes and and matter swirling in down the throat of a black hole just before it goes to die radiates x-rays and we we calculated this and we knew this and we said we're going to find black holes in the universe we need an x-ray telescope well the x-ray machines are huge we ha then we got to make them smaller to fit into the into the this the the orbit the orbiting satellite. And so a company called American Science and Engineering, based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, okay, pioneered small X-ray detectors, and then they got tapped by the government and say, Will you bring those into every airport in the country, every international airport? And thus was born X-ray detectors at airports because of astrophysicists. I'm just now, telling. Were any were any of these astrophysicists also hijacking planes? Because I can see a connection. <laughs> oh, oh mm. the conspiracy theories. Yes. Okay. And, and one of the leaders of that was a guy named Ricardo Giacconi. And uh, he was also a professor, uh, a scientist up at the Harvard College Observatory, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Today, it's just called the Center for Astrophysics. And when I was an undergraduate there, I worked in his group the X-ray group, we did some things, all right? And he would later be given the Nobel Prize for pioneering X-ray, opening up an entire new window on the universe, X-ray astronomy. So, and another cool thing is, uh, I would later be tapped by the White House to serve on a committee to, to give out the Presidential Medal of Science, okay? And oh. this is under the George W. Bush White House. So I'm there, and we get invited to the ceremony. So I, I'm ready to enter the White House. And he's, oh, we, we awarded it to him. He'd already gotten the Nobel Prize. Dude, give him the Presidential Medal of Science, okay? Right, so, exactly. So he's coming into little, the- A little bit of a letdown. Uh, right, I know, I know. But so he comes in, right, and he's going through this, this there's this, this house you have to walk through before you get to the White House. And that's where all the security measures are. So he's walking through- and I can't help but notice the White House is using an American science and engineering x-ray detector, which this guy invented. It was his company. It's his company. And I said, well, we, cool. told, we have come full circle here. There yeah. it is. That, uh, that, that's so funny. Is like the guy who made the thing that you're using for security is the ultimate security risk. <laughs> Because he would know what. Because he knows all the back doors if there is any. Because <laughs> he invented, he knows what. Yeah, exactly. That that you would know? be the case. Yeah, if you're using yeah. his machine, he'll know right. how to. He'll get know by how his to own get machine. around anything in his own inventions. You know, if, if if he had come to the White House when I was head of security, I'd been like, Nah, get that guy up against the wall, full pat down, full pat down, <laughs> cavity search. That's <laughs> right, everything. We gotta make sure this guy knows how to hide stuff. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so when you go through, they're not ASNE detectors anymore, but that was the birth of that entire movement. And it was astrophysicists serving our needs happened to also serve the needs of the government. By the way, I retell that story uh, in, in my book, um, Accessory to War, the okay. unspoken alliance between astrophysics and the military. And more broadly, it's between astrophysics and security. Hey, I'm Adrian Solgard and I reinvented the suitcase. I love to travel, but I can never stay organized. You know when you get to your hotel, you open your suitcase and everything goes everywhere? That's why we created the Carry-On Closet, a revolutionary suitcase that keeps you organized on the go. The Carry-On Closet has a patented built-in shelving system, compression straps to save space, and an even one Time Magazine Best Inventions of the Year. 
Oh, and for every suitcase sold, we save 229 plastic bottles from going into our ocean. Learn more at Solgard.co. So, Chuck, so the interesting thing about x-rays, we think of them as penetrating through objects, right? Special kind of light energy. Yes. But it's not as weird as you think, okay? Okay. You realize visible light penetrates glass. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> That's why windows are made of glass. Uh, okay. I mean, listen, I know that that was a scientific stretch, but. Uh... <laughs> okay. But, but wait a minute. But let's, let's keep going here. Do you know that glass blocks x rays and high energy light? Okay. All right, now we're doing something. So not all substances are transparent to all bands of light. That's okay. all I'm trying to say. I got you. Okay, so right. microwaves, which is what your phone use to communicate, right? they clearly pass through walls because when yep. you go indoors, you can still use your cell phone. I mean, unless, of course, you have Sprint. I mean, <laughs> no. oh, stop. <laughs> I mean, then, you know, give it up. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, oh my God. How, hey, Diego Sprint I... is a sponsor of Star Talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm roaming in the kitchen, but not in the living room? What? Okay. Right. So, uh, so microwaves pass through walls that are otherwise opaque to you. So, the fact that x rays go through like luggage and things and human flesh, uh, you, know, you know what x rays don't really go through? They don't really go through your bones. I was about to say, why don't you, if you really want to fool an x-ray, just make everything out of human bones. No, 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 no. So, no. So, it doesn't, does not go through bones. So, bones cast a shadow on what it is they're trying to view. Ah, you so see? really, what you're, you're not seeing the bones. You're themselves. not seeing the bone. You're seeing the fact that you're the x-ray went everywhere else except but, the bones. Exactly. Right. So, it's like when you stand in front of the sun and you do a puppet, you know, uh, on the ground, a, a, a shadow puppet. Yeah, it's really just the, you know, the, it's not the image of your hand, it's the absence of your hand. Correct. It right. is, it, it is, it is, you're giving meaning to the absence of sunlight. Right. Where your hands had blocked the photons from exactly. hitting the sand. Right. So, so, so that's, that's what's happening. What, in it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's and, cool. And so that's cool. When Wilhelm Röntgen uh, discovered X-rays, and he put his hand in front of it, and he saw that there the he saw the bones. He could barely see the flesh because the, the it it went right through his flesh. Okay. Right. When you're looking out a window, you're not looking at the window. You're looking at what's beyond the window. Okay. So he's looking at. He doesn't see the. He sees the bones because the X-rays were absorbed by the bones. And you also think I saw his wedding ring or something, which absorbed even more X-rays. And that was like pitch black rather than sort of grayish. And please do not ask why his wedding ring was made out of human bone. <laughs> Stop. He, Stop. He's a weird, kinky man, okay. that Wilhelm. <laughs> Wilhelm Röntgen. In fact, in all the rest of the world, they call Röntgen rays rather than X-rays. Um, but oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, point is, uh, X-rays are useful for looking through your luggage and finding things that you might make a weapon out of, typically out of metal. But they will not find weapons made out of things that are not metal and are otherwise transparent to plastic, like um, a plastic gun. Right? If you make a plastic gun, it's not, it's not going to find it in the same way it would reveal a... A regular a metal, metal gun. gun. So here's what big you time, can big do time now. Controversy on that too about yeah, uh, printable guns. Correct, correct. So here's an interesting thing you can do. Uh, like I like you said, like I noted, um, the bone does not completely block the X-rays. It just blocks more X-rays than your flesh does. So it casts its own mild shadow in the photograph. Okay. If you have different frequencies of light and you interplay them, you can see what the trend line is in the thing's attempt to absorb it or not. And once you do that, you're better at detecting what could be in the suitcase if you move the frequencies back and forth. But what they also do is they attach color. This is the literal use of 
false color. Whether you attach a color to the edges of signals that are shown up in the image, in the x-ray image. Because your eye picks up color much better than it picks up uh, tiny changes in, in a grayscale shadings, right? right? So if, if I say anything grayer than this level, make it red, and anything less gray than that, make it blue, your eye, pip, boom! I see red and blue as two completely separate things rather than as the continuum that it is. So the folks back there, the TSA, they have a fascinating task ahead of them to identify objects and shapes and, right. and, and, and highlight them in ways that it makes it easy for the person looking, through your, looking at your luggage rather than harder. Yeah, yeah, that's that's super cool. And I wonder, do they assign a special color uh, to uh, sex toys? Because <laughs> they tend to somehow find them all the time. I've never seen this ever happen. Um, is, is this you trying to pull sex toys through the security? Is this? You? I, I'm just saying. I don't know how every time it. You, you heard know, that, that this happened. That's what I, I hear. It. That somehow they're just like, got to check that one, and it's just like, <laughs> nope, just another <laughs> sex toy. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Everything's great. <laughs> All good. No this reason to be alarmed. Here. Just this another tech sex toy. Sir, you're free to go with your <laughs> sex toy. <laughs> uh, and by the way, those the those flappy things at the entrance with your luggage into the machine. Yes. They're like have heavy metal particles in them, so the X-rays don't come out. So don't reach in there, because it's trying to shield you from the X-rays that would otherwise uh, leak out of that hole. Nice. There, there you go. Well, there that is, is super. Oh, I, I have to tell you, I will never look at the x-ray machine again this, the same way. This is what I'm way. saying. And I want you to think of astrophysicist when you do. I, and I, I will now, which I have never done before. <laughs> I can say that with X-rays are just another band of light that comes to us from the depths of space that humans on Earth with excellent engineering has exploited for all manner of social, cultural, geopolitical purposes. Look at that. Thank there you, you Wilhelm. <laughs> okay. Some long ago, sometime, I think we talked about the rocket equation. I want to talk about yeah. that again, but then take us into space with it and talk about some other stuff as well. Okay, oh, okay. so you ready? All right. So he, here Blast you go. Blast off. Uh, there you go. <laughs> all right. So if you're going to drive from New York to California. Right, which I'm never going to do. And you have... You know, and you have an and you have an internal combustion engine car. They're right. called ICE cars in the in the lingo, by the way. Uh, internal combustion engine. You fill up the tank with gas until right. it's empty, and, right. and then you fill it up again. Correct. And then you fill it up again till you till you get to California. Right. You have convenient filling stations along the way. All along the way, just little daggers in the heart of the earth. All along the way. <laughs> now, if you didn't have those, right, you would need a single tank big enough to get you to California. <laughs> a single tank, okay? right? So we have to ask, what does that tank weigh? All right. right. Now, if that tank weighs as much as the car. And then some, maybe. Mm -hmm. Then the fuel you're burning in New York, part of that is just simply to move the car that's filled with fuel you haven't burned yet. Exactly. Such is the challenge with rockets. Because we don't have filling stations in space, every ounce of fuel you burn is to get the next ounce of fuel higher up so that it could then burn afterwards. Okay? So right. let's let's run a quick mathematical example. You ready? Okay. Okay. If I tell you it takes one pound of fuel okay. to put one pound of payload into orbit, suppose I want to put two pounds of payload. I'm going to need two pounds of fuel. No. You're going to need a pound of fuel for each oh, of those pounds. Damn. I need the fuel uh, for the fuel. I need fuel, fuel, the fuel. for the fuel. Damn, you need that's fuel right. For the fuel. <clears throat> okay. So I need a okay. pound of fuel for the pound, a pound of fuel for the fuel. <laughs> for the fuel. Okay. So now that's three pounds of fuel. Fuel, right. To put to get one, two pounds into orbit. Two pounds, okay? right. Now let's go three pounds of payload. 
Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a pound each for each of those. That's three pounds. Right. Okay. Plus a pound of fuel for each of those three pounds of fuel. So I need so that's yeah, six. six. Okay. But wait. Then, am I saying this right now? Then you need a pound of fuel for the fuel that's going to get the three pounds of fuel into orbit. The point is, that's right. whether or not I even explain that accurately, <laughs> the, you get the point here. The point here is that the amount of fuel you need for every increment of payload grows exponentially. And it's a famous equation called the rocket equation. Right. And that's why if you saw the launch of of either the Apollo missions, if you're an old timer, or the recent the Artemis. recent um Artemis missions, right? You see this huge rocket. Huge. And way at the top is the Orion uh capsule and right. the service module and the capsule. It's way, it's the little thing at the top. And right. everything else is fuel. Because that has to go not only to Earth orbit, but to the moon and back. And the astronauts are the payload plus whatever the hell else they're taking up there. So the, so a more realistic calculation would be uh, 10 pounds of fuel for one pound in orbit of, of payload, right? That's more realistic. So now two pounds is, one, is you need a, 10 pounds for that extra pound of fuel plus 10 pounds of fuel for the 10 pounds 10 of fuel pounds that got fuel the fuel other fuel. pound of fuel. Yeah, okay? So it, it's crazy. It's completely it's crazy. crazy. You would not need any of that if we had filling stations in space. Yeah. You just need fuel to get to the next filling station. And Then you and refuel it, and then keep going. It'd be like driving across the country. And in this economy, God, I tell you. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> 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 oh, we have we, price we of have, gas. Oh we my God! Even factored right. in inflation. Okay, so now here's an interesting fact. Okay, when you burn your um, gasoline, okay, uh, it, it uh, how does it uh, turn into energy? You remember? Um, there's a small spark. It turns into an explosion. It pushes a piston. It's a spark. Right. Correct. And the explosion is the gasoline plus what? Um, they infuse it with air or something to, like it's a, it becomes air, a fuel. Air. And what's air. in the air? That it, oxygen. It, yeah, yeah. So the air, what's in the air? Oxygen. Thank you. So you have gasoline plus oxygen makes energy. Okay. When it oh, burns. Gotcha. You got the oxygen for free. It's just sitting there in the air. Right. Okay. If I have a rocket. I wanted to leave the air. If I'm leaving the air, I don't have oxygen. Oh no. I have to bring the oxygen with me. Oh, this is getting more expensive all the time. <laughs> okay, so here you go. So the, do you remember the Artemis uh, and the space shuttle has two solid rocket boosters on the side? Right. Okay, the, the two boosters, and then it releases them. All right, right. Those yes. two boosters burn air with their mixture. When the rocket gets high enough, they're done. We can't have them trying to work where there's little air because what's the point of that? So you get to use the free air to launch the rocket at its lowest level through the atmosphere where there's plenty of oxygen. Right. Then they drop away, and anything that happens after that needs its own oxidizer. Uh -huh. And the fuel tanks that not only started burning at the base at, uh, on the launch pad, but continue in orbit is the larger tank that has two tank containers. One of them holds hydrogen, and the other holds oxygen. And the hydrogen tank is twice as big as the oxygen tank. Okay. So when I mix them, what's the mixture? That Ooh, sounds. A why do I bit, want twice? Sounds a little bit like H two O. Oh. Hmm. Well, yes. So when I mix hydrogen and oxygen, it is highly exothermic, meaning it releases 
tons of energy and the and the and the exhaust is water oh wow water water so 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 we have this incredible uh you know propellant yes. that the byproduct is water yes why doesn't everything run on that <laughs> I love, I love the, the gears are going in Chuck's head. I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. 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 There isn't hydrogen just laying around. Uh, okay. I uh, got you. It, but it's everywhere in water. But pure hydrogen is just so you have to get the hydrogen. Uh, so you're going to get it from the water to begin with. Uh, and guess how much energy it takes to separate the H2 from the O. More than it does to put a rock in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a text. Okay. So, so, so the energy it takes to separate the hydrogen and oxygen is slightly more than you're going to get back by recombining right. the hydrogen and the oxygen. I see. Yeah. That, so it's not quite an equal thing, but yeah, that that's how you get your hydrogen fuel. It sucks. It totally that sucks. sucks. <laughs> and where are you going to get that energy from? Is it a, 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 a oil plant or whatever? You know, right. you, can, you can use solar power to do that, by the way. And so, but I'm just saying, th there's no such thing as a free lunch. There That's have. all. And by the way, they use uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen because that's it's much denser. You get way more fuel than if it's just gaseous hydrogen and gaseous oxygen. Right. But liquid hydrogen is liquid at like four is that i forgot the number but low single digit kelvin temperature oh wow okay we got a whole other explainer on kelvin low single digits so the the whole thing is chilled and that's why you look at some launch um videos of of the saturn 5 rocket you see this ice oh, falling yes. off the sides yes it's florida where the hell's the ice come from right. because this stuff is cold all right keeping liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen so that when they combine, you have the maximum number of molecules to do it, get the maximum amount of exothermic reaction, and you get the maximum thrust. And according to Newton, you cannot move forward unless you spew something else back out the other side. Mm. Normally, for if me, you're going to move in <laughs> hatred. Yeah, I'm glad you said that instead of flatulence. <laughs> otherwise, you could crouch. That, that was my first thought, but I was like, oh, "Let's go." That was your deeper. first thought, right? I was okay. Like, let's, go a Let, let's get. Let, let's be a little more mature. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the point is, uh, unless you have friction to help propel you forward, if you're just trying to move through the through space or through the air, something mm -hmm. has to come out the back, mm -hmm. so that you propel forward. For every action, there's an equal and opposite. Reaction. reaction and that's why you have this huge plume coming out the other side and so this that's the rockets 101 for you that's very cool just that saying cool. chuck we did it yeah we got through airplanes and airports and and somehow i i i i, I we had no problem with the tsa which is really cool <laughs> that's very cool man that, that worked out it worked yeah. out fine <laughs> worked out all right, so this has been another Star Talk, a Things You Thought You Knew edition. I thank my co-host Chuck. Always a pleasure. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. As always, I bid you to keep looking up.